All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to our first webinar of 2014, where we're going to be talking about Weibo and WeChat, and we're going to be talking about the, uh, obviously as part of that, understanding the Chinese social media. Um, thank you so much for everyone joining us so far, and um, I understand, you know, if you're over in WA, it's a nice early start to the uh, uh, to your learning, I guess, for a, um, for a Thursday. And um, if you're joining us from, uh, from New Zealand, I guess you're a little bit closer to knockoff, um, so lucky you guys. Um, I'll introduce myself first and also then go through a little bit of um, uh, an understanding of what we're going to be going through today in the webinar. Uh, my name's Gareth, I'm the training consultant here for Icentia, so I'm going to be delivering this webinar and the other ones we um, uh, go through. So um, when it comes to the content today, we're going to be talking about first the the Chinese social, um, uh, sorry, digital landscape, what it sort of looks like for us. So um, if you're joining us from um, uh, from China or from Asia or uh, for ANZ as well, we want to have a look first at the uh, what the digital space looks like over there. We'll then jump into talking about social media and these platforms. Now, one thing I want to stress at the beginning is that this, these platforms can be used for two real measures for, uh, for an ANZ audience. So for Australian and New Zealand brands and organisations, you can either be using it to communicate with um, uh, a, an audience in Australia of Chinese nationals or anyone who's using these platforms as well as actually using it to communicate with um, uh, an, an overseas audience. So it really is two-pronged and we'll talk about both of those as we go through. So we'll have a chat about Weibo and WeChat and what they look like and um, I guess some of, the, some of the challenges, some of the opportunities with those platforms. Then we'll round it off with a little bit of a, you know, anything else you should know about um, uh, the content, etc., and some of the challenges you may face. Um, and if you do have any questions as we go through, please uh, drop it in the question panel uh, as part of um, uh, GoTo, and we'll get to those at the end. So feel free to throw any questions that you have at me, and we'll cover those off at the end. Um, one other little bit of a note, we are recording this webinar as well, so we'll actually shoot this out to you guys uh, in, an e in a follow-up email. So you can send it off to a, um, a colleague or a friend who you think might get some value out of it, or you can listen to it over and over and over again if you really enjoy the sound of my voice. Uh, either way, we'll be uh, shooting that out to you at the end of the presentation. So let's jump in and talk about the, uh, the, the digital landscape uh, uh, in China. So. Um, I guess um, uh, some of you may have uh, heard the colloquial term, the, uh, the Great Firewall of China. So um, that's one of the biggest challenges a lot of us have when trying to communicate to an overseas platform. And then in, in turn is, um, uh, has changed the way that a lot of um, uh, Chinese expats use social media is the fact that the Chinese government obviously blocks a lot of sites within China. This, um, uh, as we're probably all aware, poses some really big challenges because a lot of the traditional um, platforms that we utilize aren't actually available to be used over, um, uh, to be used in, in China. So the likes of YouTube and Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, a lot of the social media platforms that we use uh, across ANZ to communicate with our audience here aren't accessible there. So if we're trying to reach a, um, a wider audience, it is a lot more challenging to get to that audience. Off the back of that as well, um, people who move over to ANZ who have, um, who have come from China may be using these platforms as part of you know, the habitual way of communicating with their friends and family or just the social media platforms that they're used to using. So whether you are looking um, uh, trying to target a Chinese audience in China or one that's um, uh, within ANZ, the traditional platforms may pose some challenges, but these two that we'll talk about can obviously open up some opportunities, open up some doors for us by way of who we want to talk to. Um, also, one thing we also have to very much get a bit of a scope on is the size of, of, of the digital economy over in China. Um, I do a lot of travelling across ANZ, um, uh, delivering training, etc. And um, even uh, for the likes of when I'm in Adelaide and Perth, they often they often tell me, "Oh, you're from Sydney. Oh, I hear the traffic there is tremendous." And it is. Sydney traffic can be um, an absolute pain in the backside. But to put that within, to put that in context, and put that in a bit of perspective, there was a 10-day traffic jam. Um, uh, coming into, I believe it was Bang. Oh, sorry, um, uh, coming into uh, Beijing. I don't know if you guys heard about this a couple of years ago. So, thinking about a 10-day traffic jam by way of people, by way of um, uh, just the, the the roads, and then think about that how that translates to the digital scope that were, that were held over there. It is a huge opportunity if we are trying to reach an audience over in uh, over in China, particularly because of the um, uh, sheer number. So depending on what we're trying to do, whether it's tourism, selling a product, or even awareness about uh, opportunities when they do come to Australia or New Zealand, thinking about the, um, uh, the scope and the size of this audience. 
One of the other really interesting uh, challenges, opportunities, or, or natures of the um, uh, the digital space within China is the rise of key opinion leaders, or KOLs. Now, we have, we generally refer to these as influencers in uh, in Australia and New Zealand. So uh, we're obviously fairly familiar with the different types of influencers. Um, Instagram has definitely given a rise to something similar to what we've seen in China, but the power of key opinion leaders is tremendous. Um, the one we're referring to here on this image is actually um, uh, in 2012, um, Queenstown, uh, well, New Zealand, New, New Zealand Tourism and Queenstown sort of got together to um, to try to promote Queenstown as an idyllic location for a wedding or even just a, um, uh, a, a place to nick over to for a, um, a short holiday. And they um, uh, there was a bit of a sponsorship with um, Yao Chen, who is a, they refer to her as the Queen of Weibo. And so a uh, huge following um, uh, on the platform, as well as um, uh, the fact that she's a, a, a well-renowned um, Chinese actress. And so by utilising her her channels, her um, uh, impact on um, uh, on these platforms. It was incredibly tremendous for um, uh, for Queenstown and for um, New Zealand tourism in general to really get a bit more of a cut through in, in an audience and really put Queenstown and New Zealand in a broader sense as a as a great tourist location, as a as a place to consider with your next overseas holiday. Obviously, I'd be biased. I'd say Sydney would definitely be the way to go, but it's a fantastic way of using uh, key opinion leaders. Now we do obviously, um, similar to Instagram as well, and what we see um, uh, on the platforms that we're used to, you do see a mixture of key opinion leaders. You see broad ones such as an actress who a lot of people follow, and you also see ones within specific industries as well. So you might see um, see ones within the tech industry, or you might see ones within the tourism industry or the photography industry. So these key opinion leaders may not always be, you, you may not always be looking for ones with the millions and millions of followers, but ones which have a lot more influence and sway within particular interest groups. So key opinion leaders, if you're thinking about it from a, uh, from a campaign point of view, can be a really effective way to get your, get your message seen and, and have other people spruiking up. It's similar even to the fact that you know we pay a lot more credence to when our friends and family share content as opposed to from, from a brand. So using these KOLs can be a great way to get your message to wider audience and have that backing of that individual. So now I want to jump in and talk about um, social media within China and um, obviously, as I mentioned, talk about the two major platforms or players, those being WeChat and Weibo. So um, these become or sort of emerged as the two dominant social media platforms uh, over in China. WeChat, you're looking at about 818 million monthly active users, so using this app um, uh, every, each and every month. Uh, to put that in perspective, you're looking at about uh, 1.6 billion on Facebook, uh, you're looking at about 600 million on Instagram, so really is quite a large platform um, and one which goes very um, very much unknown by way of um, what we traditionally think of um, social media platforms. Um, I will give you a bit of a, uh, a bit of an overall view of this. Weibo, we're referring to in this presentation, um, Weibo is, is center Weibo. So Weibo itself actually just means microblog. Um, and there were quite a few which sort of popped up um, uh, by way of being these social media microblogging platforms. But the one is, which has emerged as, I won't say clear winner, has been center Weibo. Uh, um, and so that's the one we're referring to, and that's got about 319 million monthly active users. So still a large audience, I'm sitting close to the numbers of um, Twitter's monthly active users. Um, and so I, I want to talk about how these platforms differ, and they really are chalk and cheese. It's similar to when we think about using platforms within an ANZ audience, we need to think about what the platforms can offer us, what the audience and demographics are like on those platforms, as to whether or not it's going to be a viable option for us. So I want to talk about the evolution of, of messaging. And so um, a lot of us have view, I'm gathering, um, uh, have used um, uh, you know, some of the more well-renowned um, social media platforms like Facebook, like Twitter, perhaps like LinkedIn, which sort of sit um, up, up on the top left here of this graph. Uh, you know, you've got a high amount of contacts, but you may be, may be sending the messages a lot more infrequently. So you might be putting out one post a day or two posts a day on Facebook, um, but you've got a larger audience on those platforms. What we're seeing is um, a rise of some of these peer-to-peer -peer messaging platforms. So the likes of um, uh, WeChat, the likes of um, uh, Snapchat, and even um, uh, WhatsApp, which is now uh, which has been for a while owned by Facebook, and even um, Facebook Messenger. These are the sort of 
platforms where brands and organizations can communicate a little bit more intimately with their, uh, with their audience. I'm not sure if you've um, uh, seen the changes when it comes to Facebook by way of uh, Facebook Messenger where chat box, chat bots, <laughs> apologies for my pronunciation then, chat bots have been introduced as an incredible way to, to increase communications with individual Facebook users. So um, Cineweibo sort of sits up there similar to Facebook and Twitter, and we'll talk about that because it is often referred to as the Chinese Twitter, and I'll sort of dispel a little bit of that. Whereas WeChat sits along with these um, uh, devices similar to, uh, sorry, these applications similar to Facebook Messenger, uh, WhatsApp, or Snapchat. And in fact, it's a little bit more one-to-one -one communications. I'm not saying that either one of, uh, is better than the other. Once again, it um, depends on how you're looking at using these platforms. So I want to talk about Weibo first off, um, uh, and as mentioned, quite often referred to as the, the Chinese Twitter. Um, looking at about 100 million daily active users, so people jumping on the platform every day, and about 200 million searches each day. So I'm um, similar to uh, more so Twitter and the fact you can search the Twitter sphere to see what people are talking about, um, topics, etc. Um, you can do the same on Weibo. Um, Splitwise, by way of demographics, you're looking at sort of a slightly um, a female orientated market, whereas, uh, and also a younger demographic being um, uh, with 50% of the audience being between 18 and 25. It's not too surprising um, uh, given, uh, given the nature of um, social media's uptake in China. So um, that's what this sort of looks like by way of the demographics and the usage of, uh, of Weibo. Now this would look a little familiar, and I will we'll put a, a little bit of a caveat to this. This has been translated via Google Translate, and I'll come back to that at the end of the um, presentation about the impact of that, and we want to make sure we're actually obviously talking the correct dialects on these platforms. So this is a, the homepage for Icentius platform. Um, I want to cover off a couple of things. If you notice up there on the um, uh, on, on the logo, on the Icentia logo, there, there's a, a blue tick, a verified tick, and so really encourage it when um, uh, when we're using these platforms from an organization or a brand point of view, verification is very important by way of what it allows you. But also, uh, if your XYZ brand or uh, a government organization, whatever the, cha um, uh, whatever the situation is, you'd want people to know that it's a verified account. Because obviously, um, you can create an account under any name, so we want to make sure we verify that account, get that blue tick and show authenticity. Now, it does work a lot. It, it does. The platform itself looks a lot similar to Twitter and what we've used Twitter for. But um, that being said, uh, the character limit, so Weibo used to have a character limit of 140 characters. That being said, these are Chinese characters, whether they're traditional or, um, or simplified Chinese. Uh, 140 Chinese characters is a lot more than 140 characters um, in, in how we use English. So um, they did actually remove that character limit last year as well. So you don't have that restriction um, on this platform. Uh, that being said, once again, uh, it's how you utilize it. Um, and so you want to be aware that um, uh, that restriction isn't there. Still operates a little bit like Twitter, although the one big change is that you can actually comment on posts, um, which brings a little bit more, uh, uh, it makes it a little bit more of a hybrid between Twitter and Facebook. You can comment on posts and obviously you can share and like and engage with that content. Um, and so the commenting is a little bit, so which is where it sort of tr um, uh, changes its similarity from Twitter. Yes, you can reply to tweets, etc. cetera. Um, but this means, you know, the conversation is actually underneath the uh, underneath the post itself. Um, this shouldn't be too much of a surprise given the, um, uh, the, the similar sort of statistics with uh, the social media platforms that we're more, um, more acclimatized to, but 85% of Weibo users are on mobile. And so once again, that impacts your message, it impacts the content you put up there. People are using social media on mobile. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a, a shock to anyone. Um, and so we shouldn't think of anything different when we're thinking about Weibo what type of content, what sort of call to action, um, how we're sort of messaging and when we're messaging it to our audience. Um, there are also hashtags on, uh, on Weibo, which is similar to, to Twitter. Um, the only difference is that you actually use two hashtags when you're um, uh, assigning it to a topic or a theme. So whereas um, we might do hashtag social media if we're putting out a post from Icentia, maybe promoting this webinar, uh, on Weibo, it would be hashtag social media hashtag, and that sort of opens and closes it off. And just like on Twitter, this is aggregating that topic data and, uh, and topic information so you can have a look and join in a conversation. 
Um, so that's the, the Weibo side of things. Obviously, we'll talk um, uh, a little bit more about it once we get to um, uh, the content side. But talking WeChat. Now, WeChat is, um, as I mentioned, is um, a, a lot larger by way of daily, uh, monthly active users. And same with um, daily active users. Um, 570 million people use this app on a daily basis. Uh, now, once, once again, like I mentioned, it is similar to uh, messaging apps. So a lot of people use this as a peer-to-peer -peer messaging app. Um, so like your WhatsApp, where you're communicating with friends and family on a daily basis. However, that's not, um, uh, that, that's not to detract from it in any way, shape, or form, because that's what a lot of 80% uh, of people use Facebook for to check in with friends and family, etc. So um, uh, it is still you know, a little bit peer-to-peer -peer side of things, which does give us that opportunity for a bit of a more intimate relationship with our audiences. 60% uh, are, uh, are aged between 15 and, um, uh, and 29, so it's still quite a young demographic. All that being said, demographics aren't everything. We need to think about behaviours and still a bit of a female skew on the platform. Now, I take this with a grain of salt, users peak times at 10 p.m., which is a little bit later than what we generally think, but that's obviously people jumping on um, uh, the application to, to communicate with people before they're um, uh, heading off to, to, to the land of nods. So uh, that's the peak time out of everything. But that being said, that uh, similar to how you use Twitter, think similar to how you use Facebook with your audience, it's not about you know jumping on when the peak time is. It's about thinking about your audience. When are they most likely to engage with your content that is when we should be thinking about when we're posting the content out. 62% um, of um, uh, users find official accounts through friends sharing. So it is similar to WhatsApp in the fact that we've got peer-to-peer -peer messaging, but it, there's a content level, there's a moments part um, on, on, um, on WeChat, which is almost like a Facebook feed. So you can jump on there, see what your friends are, uh, are posting. So in addition to peer-to-peer -peer messaging, see what people are posting and Generally, 62% of people find official accounts through content that their friends have shared. So um, obviously sharing is a really important part by way of um, uh, how we traditionally look at social media, but obviously really important in, uh, in a WeChat context because the chance of people coming to find and, and searching for our, uh, our organisation, our brand accounts on WeChat, that's one thing, but making sure that we can get people um, getting popping into people's news or news feeds for lack of a better term, um, is really important. So um, one challenge is you can't, uh, you can't monetize the sharing aspect or you can't um, be seen to be trying to reward sharing. Um, uh, so by that I mean you can't say share this and we'll give you 10% off or share this and we'll um, uh, provide you with a free product because WeChat really frowns on that and they do actually um, uh, restrict accounts um, if, you, if you are seen to continue doing that. So make sure that, you know, it's not about encouraging people to share by a reward sense, but just making it really kick-ass content that people would want their their peers to see, they want their friends and family to see that content. Uh, when it comes to content that's shared now, um, you can obviously, similar to um, uh, the platforms we're used to, articles, um, images, videos, these do sit within the WeChat platform though, so it's not linking to an external site. But um, the top three topics tend to be education and information, health and wellness, and politics. Um, so think about what your audience is going on this platform to read. Um, one other thing as well is that when, um, uh, so you've got your, your WeChat account, your branded organisation WeChat account, uh, when someone actually searches for, um, for that account and um, engages with it, when they um, uh, click to follow, effectively what, that will, uh, what you can do from that is actually send a message to that person. So it's an automated message, a, um, a, a standard message which will engage and that you use that to tell your audience what you're going to be sending and what sort of great content you'll be sending them on the platform. Now that being said, and we'll get into it in two moments, the way that content appears for your audience is vastly different to Weibo, Twitter, Facebook, etc. I want to give you guys a little bit more context as well as to the breadth of WeChat. Um, so we talk about messaging, yeah, video, uh, phone calls and video calls, etc. and conferencing. Um, but things like Moments, which is like I mentioned, the um, uh, sort of your news feed side of things, there's the ability to do payments and gifting through this, uh, and which you can actually do as, a, um, uh, as an organisation as well. So some brands actually accept payment through WeChat, which is a vastly different thing to what we'd usually think about by way of um, uh, traditional social media. Uh, that being said, um, I did read an article where they said there was, a monitor, uh, there was a currency aspect to built into Facebook Messenger. So, I would not be surprised if we see uh, Facebook Messenger chasing down this sort of side of things as well. Um, wallet, location-based marketing, and, and they've even got a taxi side of things, which is similar to Uber. So it's a, it's so many different um, 
disruptive uh, products brought into the one app. Um, which is obviously why there's 570 million people jumping back on this every day because it is a little bit of their uh, their lifeblood. Now, when setting up an account, so we um, traditionally, you know, we choose to set up a page or a business account, um, uh, whether it's you know, um, uh, thinking about Instagram or Facebook, would set it up as a page or a business account. Now, there are two different types of accounts. Um, uh, sorry, three different types of accounts that we can have when it comes to WeChat. Now, one of the challenges is that an international WeChat, uh, WeChat account, so that would be if we were to set one up from Australia, from New Zealand, we go, bingo, we're going to set up our brand, um, our brand account, and here we go. Now, you can, um, uh, act, you can talk to any people outside of China, but you cannot communicate with people who are identified as living within China you would need a Chinese WeChat account. So if you had an international WeChat account, you could still communicate with um, any of the WeChat users in Australia and New Zealand, and that is a growing demographic as well as people using that platform within Australia um, and New Zealand. But if you want to communicate to people within China, so you do want to use it for demand generation, whatever the case is, you're trying to um, talk to a Chinese um, uh, audience within China, you would actually need to have a, China, a Chinese WeChat account. Now, what that means is that you actually have to have a premises within China, so you technically have to have a business or a, a, an organization head there, so an office location. Alternatively, there are marketing organizations who can do this on your behalf. So if you want to talk to and communicate with an audience within China, you need that second account. And you do need to think about this before you get going. Now, I mentioned there are three types of um, WeChat accounts off the back of that. Uh, we'll, on the right there, we've got the enterprise account, which is sort of more for um, organizations. We're going to ignore that for the sake of this. Uh, we're going to talk about subscription accounts and service accounts. And once again, you do need to choose this from the get-go. Uh, you can't change it. Um, you, can't, you can have one subscription and one service account, but obviously it's just the same as having a Facebook, uh, several Facebook accounts or Twitter accounts. It does mean you need to manage, etc., and monitor, so it does, it does become a little bit more challenging. So what is the difference? So a service account is effectively, it's a little bit more restricted in the amount of messages you can send your audience. You can only do four broadcast um, messages per month. But the difference is they'll actually get a notification. So similar to if their friend had messaged them saying, hey buddy, um, what time are you coming to dinner? They would get a push notification that your brand or organization has messaged them. A subscription account, you can send one message per day. However, all subscription accounts are actually held within that one folder. So, as example, as an example, if um, uh, if, if a user has a follow is following, say, ten different subscription accounts from a government organisations to brands to news, etc., they would have to go into their subscription folder, and then they would see your messages in there. So, once again, that's a difference. One is um, they need to sort of seek out your content within the folder on the application versus the service account where it's actually getting pushed out to them. Um, it also, uh, the service account also does provide you some custom menu support. And so what that means is similar to that chatbot bot aspect, where people can begin to, to chat with an automated level. You can go in there and respond to them from the messages. So um, a user can message your, um, uh, your service account, ask you a question about your organization, whatever the case is, however, whatever questions we may even possibly get through um, Messenger on Facebook at the moment. But you can also have automated responses to that based on keywords. So um, uh, as an example, um, if it is a brand, it might, um, uh, in their message, they may, say, um, uh, they may say the word of price, and you can then respond with a piece of content that has the pricing information in it. So you can automate a lot of this, but obviously it does also mean you can go back and engage with your audience in a rich one-to-one -one environment. So there are two different accounts, so you do need to think about that before you set up. Um, and, and we'll go into goals if, um, uh, in two moments because we really need to make sure we are thinking about what we're trying to achieve before we jump onto one of these platforms. Now, um, a little bit of a, it's a bit of a scope as to um, how WeChat see people using their, um, uh, their platform, their app, and I won't go into this in too much detail, but effectively they see people using WeChat across the day from whether they jump, wake up in the morning and want to jump, and, um, uh, jump straight on and browse the moment, see what their friends have shared, etc through when they're paying for their coffee, um, using it in the lunchtime break to read more articles on the, um, uh, on the commute home, all these different things. WeChat sees it as a constant engagement throughout the day. Um, and so obviously, once again, we need to think about if we were to send out messages on this platform, similar to 
um, uh, similar to Twitter, when are we going to be best at um, uh, cutting through and reaching our audience and when would be the best time to send these messages out? So that's a look at those two platforms from obviously a very um, uh, uh, top-down sort of look at it, what, what these platforms can do and what their um, uh, challenges and how they'll be utilised. But the one thing, as I just alluded to, is before you jump onto these platforms, you really need to think about what your goals are. Um, there's no sense going, oh, fantastic, there's 818 million people using WeChat every single month. Let's jump on and see if um, we can get some bang for buck off it. You need to think about what you're actually using this platform for. So what are your goals? What are your business objectives that you're trying to get out of this social media platform? Now, one other thing I'd really encourage, a word to the wise, is um, obviously these platforms, um, if you have a, um, an international WeChat account, you can definitely just push out messages in English and you can communicate to um, a, an English-speaking audience through that. Um, but obviously, if you're using Weibo or WeChat, to communicate with a, um, a, a Chinese audience, whether they are in China themselves or whether they're um, a Chinese nationals li living within ANZ, you'd want to tend to communicate in, their, um, in, in, in that language, whether it's traditional or simplified um, Chinese. So one thing you want to definitely make sure is translation. Translation is on point. Um, I'm sure we've all seen a post on Twitter, on Facebook, and the grammar's been incorrect or the spellings. Um, uh, been out of whack or maybe even the syntax and maybe even the way they put that sentence together is completely completely strange. We had a little bit of a giggle and thought, geez, they don't really know what they're doing. It's the same on these platforms. You want to make sure that when you're translating your content from, from English into simplified or um, traditional um, Chinese, you want to make sure that it, it says what you want it to. Now on screen, I've got a great example of um, one of the biggest foul-ups, for lack of a better term, um, was um, some uni students, uh, uh, when um, uh, Star Wars, the, the third one of the third one of the second trilogy, so to say, came out, and they ripped it off. They decided they wanted to throw some subtitles through it uh, instead of going to the cinema and distribute it that way. Now, because they used um, Google Translate, let's just say the meaning and the context of the movie wasn't exactly put through, and it was actually it became almost a little bit of a cult hit in the way how strange. The, the language became because it was just using Google Translate. So if you are going to be using this to communicate um, uh, to a Chinese audience overseas or locally in that language, make sure that you've got it right. Make sure that you're actually using um, a, a native, uh, someone who can speak, um, speak it as their native tongue because otherwise you're really going to miss the mark with some of the messages you're trying to put out. The other thing is content as well. Now there are some really big Differences, obviously, by way of, um, uh, obviously, cultures are different um, uh, by ANZ to China. So you want to think about the, the way that content sort of um, appears over there. For example, if you look at Weibo, there's a lot of emojis used even in the posts, which is something that we wouldn't generally dream of too much in a, in a Facebook post from a business or an organisation here in, a, in ANZ. And so you want to make sure that, you know, um, that your, your, your content is sitting right. Now, this is just an example of um, British Airways when they started flying direct into China, they actually... Um, pretty much made one of their um, uh, planes, they dressed up and made it look like a panda. Really cute, really um, unique, and that went gangbusters across um, Weibo. It got shared an awful lot, so it was an offline activation that um, was used on the platform, but it was a really cute, really kitschy sort of aspect, so you, you want to make sure your content is audience appropriate. Um, regardless, when we're thinking about the content on this platform, we want to want to make sure that you know we've, we've either got humour, similar to the British uh, Airways side of things, emotion, Regardless of um, uh, uh, any social media platform, we want to think about the emotion that we're putting into it to really get our, uh, our content resonating with our audience. Obviously, that will increase the ability it's going to be shared and also some value. And now I don't mean, we've obviously got a dollar sign there. I don't just mean value by way of a discount or a freebie. We mean value, entertainment, inspiration, education, whatever it is. It's got to be valuable to your audience. Um, if you're pu putting all this effort into um, uh, to utilizing one of these platforms to communicate with a new audience, don't just sit back and use it from a broadcast point of view, um, throwing out dull media releases, etc. Make sure that you, um, it's, it's phenomenal content that's going to get you that goal. Why are you on this platform? Brilliant. Let's make sure that the content sits well within that, uh, uh, within that idea. So guys, that brings us to the end of the webinar. I've got a couple of um, questions which has popped, have popped through uh, as, we're, um, uh, as we're going through. So I've um, got one question here um, from Cam. Uh, is all the language used on these platforms simpler, Chinese or traditional? And so uh, it is both. 
Um, and so um, uh, one thing as well, when it comes to WeChat, it, it's generally touted as one of the better, um, better translation platforms as opposed to uh, Google Translate. So for those of you who aren't, um, you know, aren't familiar too much with our Mandarin and the Cantonese, uh, the, the translate feature within the platform isn't too bad. However, obviously, like I said, you know, you really want to make sure that uh, it's being communicated properly. Cam's hit me with another one. In terms of monitoring these platforms, uh, how much of it is available to us, i.e. not locked behind privacy settings? Um, so monitoring is in on an ongoing basis. I'll have to get back to you about that, about what tools you can use. But by way of searching, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of it's open, uh, similar to Twitter, it's open uh, to use it. So you can obviously have a closed account like you can on Twitter, but generally this content is open. It's being shared like it is on, by and large, Instagram and Twitter. So um, monitoring wise, I'll have to look to see which um, I can get back to you guys. I'll flick it out in the follow up email by way of which tools could be used. But um, yeah, it is still open, which is why it's still fantastic from a searching point of view. I uh, got one from Craig. Um, would it be better for an Australian business? Oh, sorry, which which would it be better to get um, to get into for an Australian business? Uh, it's a bit of a curly question, I guess. Um, once again, it really depends on how you're utilising it um, and what your audience is. Uh, people tend to like what we've seen by and large is that audiences, uh, sorry, organisations in ANZ do dip the toe in first with Weibo, just because it is a little bit more familiar. Um, not saying that it's any better, just because it is familiar looks a little bit more like um, Twitter and Facebook. And so uh, I, I feel that's the main reason why ANZ companies jump onto that one first. But as mentioned, uh, I think um, WeChat, by way of uh, a growing audience, by way of some of the um, uh, fancier things you can do, by way of that chatbot aspect, I think it's a little bit more robust. Um, uh, and so, but once again, really needs to come back to what your goals are as an, um, as an organization. What are you trying to do? And then which one will serve it best? Because um, obviously with um, WeChat, you're sending your messages more directly to a person, whereas Weibo, it is still very similar to um, uh, the way things drop into people's timelines and news feeds on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Jen, how often should we post on these platforms? Um, so I guess um, when it comes to WeChat, uh, depending on the uh, type of account you get, you can only, a maximum you can post is once per day on WeChat regardless of, uh, it, it, um, when I said with that subscription account you get to um, uh, use one broadcast message per day, um, you can't save that up. It's not like um, Optus prepaid rollover credit or anything like that. You've got one per day, um, and so uh, and on the subscription account side, of th sorry, on the um, service account you've got four per month. So that is a maximum. So you've got to make sure they count, they matter. Um, when it comes to Weibo, I guess um, once again it's, it's sort of how long is a piece of string. Um, we are real advocates here at I, I sent you about you know quality over over um, quantity. You know you want to make sure you've got really good messages. Uh, and not just um, uh, smashing your audience with a huge amount um, and flooding their um, uh, their Weibo feed. So you want to make sure that you're only talking when you've got something relevant to say. Uh, jumping through, um, cat common mistakes for new users on Weibo. Uh, from an ANZ, I'm assuming that's from an ANZ point of view, like what um, uh, organisations have sort of stuffed up. I think definitely not starting with a plan, not having an actual idea about what you're trying to use the platform for. Uh, as a result, it becomes dissemination of the same old boring content going, oh, we'll, we'll slap this up on, on, on Weibo and trying to um, uh, reach that audience. I think other things that we've seen is the translation thing, making sure that you know your, um, your translation is done either by someone within your org organisation who's fluent in both or using an agency to translate. And also, um, it's not just enough to put messages on that platform. I think um, one organisation I've seen, uh, which looks like they've got a really robust side of doing things, is um, uh, is Westpac, Westpac New Zealand. And so, uh, not just having the content up there, but um, making sure they've got landing pages in the same text. Because the last thing you want to do is have this beautifully translated bit of content. You throw it up there on Weibo. Um, one of the users clicks on it and it takes them to an uh, English landing page. You know, you want to make sure that you know, that journey is effective. You know, you're not just, um, it's not truncated or any way, shape or form. So you are getting the maximum um, result for what you're utilizing the platform for. So most definitely, I'd probably say they're the more common ones is not being forward thinking um, and, and and making sure that, you know, the, the communications on that platform is tight and effective. 
and I guess that sort of covers up the the other question, which is um, what brands have um, have used this successfully? Only from a um, uh, from a visual point of view of what I've seen, um, uh, uh, there are a couple of universities as well who've used um, uh, Weibo very effectively. Uh, obviously, um, uh, in Australia, education is one of our main exports, and so a couple of um, uh, universities promoting content to a uh, to an audience um, uh, over in China to to spruik their university is a fantastic place for international students. Um, and so, uh, just like any platform, there is the ability to use paid content. Um, so, um, the universities in Australia, I, for the life of me, I can't remember which one. It was one based in um, in Melbourne. Um, used it very effectively to promote content out um, uh, to an audience in China. But once again, they had all the systems set up. They had um, you know um, uh, platforms and landing pages that were in um, uh, the same language. So that conversation, that that user journey, if you will, um, was consistent and tight. Fantastic, guys. Well, that brings us to the end of um, uh, the webinar. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank, thanks so much for the, uh, for the fantastic questions as well. As I mentioned, we will follow, uh, throw out a follow-up uh, email off the back of this and look forward to seeing you on any of our webinars that we hold in the future. Thank you so much for joining us, guys.